Did you know that one in eight kids in Atlanta will go hungry tonight? Eating healthy, balanced meals is essential for kids to learn and grow. That's why Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, an education nonprofit, Common Threads, have teamed up to help schools learn about healthier food preparation. In Atlanta, they're joined by the dream and will provide education, recipes, and knowledge to students and families about healthier options. Visit anthem.com slash dream to learn more. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield is the trade name of Blue Cross Blue Shield Healthcare Plan of Georgia, Inc. As you beat the heat with the AC cranking, we're here to help you stay on track. When you visit a racetrack, it's not just about filling up your gas tank, it's about re-energizing yourself. For 90 years, we've been a neighborhood staple to help make life's little moments special. No matter where your travels take you in Atlanta, racetrack's here for whatever gets you going. And you'll be here before you know it. We're never far away. You'll find us just off Buford Road. Racetrack. Whatever gets you going. All right. It's time for a Big Blue Kickoff Live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants mobile app. 17 14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live on Giants.com and the Giants mobile app. It's brought to you by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football Giants. I am John Schmelk. He is Paul Dottino. Hope everybody had a great Father's Day weekend out there. We're here to talk Giants football with you. Again, we'll take your calls at 201-939-4513. And I have uh, broken open the uh, BBK email account. Um, I'm going to go through some questions here as well. And I did see some good topic ideas uh, from, from you guys as well. Uh, talking about um, what we can do in future shows in terms of filling some of our dead periods here Mm -hmm. uh, in June and July. Uh, Just a reminder, as a programming note, uh, we are going to go dark the week of the 4th of July. There will be nothing that week. We are going to have, I think, two or three huddles that week, though. So you'll have some content that week, just no Big Blue Kickoff. And then the following week, Big Blue Kickoff, Paul is going to record for one each day uh, one of our Opponent previews with a beat reporter. So those will be shorter, probably around 20 minutes or so. And uh, those will be up one day a week to give you your BBK fill uh, the week after July 4th. And then uh, Pearson will be back. He'll He'll be energized for the season. And we'll start working him to the bone again, which is exactly what we like to try to do. So, uh... That's what our schedule is. Next two weeks, we're good to go. Uh, we have some good theme shows going on. It's going to be a lot of Paul. Um, I'm running around doing some different stuff. A lot of Paul, a lot of SciTac. Uh, I'm on a couple of days, too, and we'll start our opponent previews next week uh, as we get through the first half of that season. Um, and we'll do our NFC East teams last, which is what we do every year, mm-hmm. uh, the week leading up to And just no BBK camp. Wednesday, too. Oh, yes, yeah. and thank you, Pearson. Office and, closed. Uh, yeah, Juneteenth on uh, June 19th on Wednesday, so no live BBK on Wednesday either. Uh, keep that in mind. Do have a couple of good giant huddles coming your way this week, though. We have Brian Baldinger. Is that up yet, Pearson? Not quite, but it should be up shortly. It's been edited. It's been delivered. It's just like it posted. Uh, basically, kind of go. he was here at one of the minicamp days. And we have a good discussion about what he saw in minicamp. And we have Kim Jones coming your way on Thursday. Kind of a summation of what the Giants did this offseason, her expectations, where she thinks the team's at, the roster's at. That was a fun conversation with Kim. So you could check those out. Uh, those are the two episodes coming your way this week. And I have not checked, but um, I will look right now. Uh, the Giants 100, A Night with Legends, is on Thursday night this week. Yeah. It is at the Theater at Madison Square Garden. I believe that there are still some tickets available. I'm looking right now as we speak. Um, it's going to be a great event, guys. Bob Pop is going to host the whole thing. Uh, you're going to have a bunch of giant legends there, some of the really big names that will get you excited. I don't want to spoil that surprise. I don't think they've put the names out there, but the guys you a think bunch of are going to be there, there are going to be there. <laughs> um, so a lot of fun announcements. Um, you know, Brian Dable, Joe Shane will have a panel. John Mara is going to be there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can ask questions to the legends, stuff like that. Um, I'll be there working the red carpet with um, a couple other guests too. So make sure you go check that out. Again, you can find the tickets at uh, Ticketmaster.com, and it does look like there are a handful of seats left. Just doing some quick clicking here. I'd say about. Under 100, probably around 50-ish. So uh, go get your tickets. There are no bad seats, by the way, in that theater, guys. Uh, It's a really good venue. I've seen a couple different shows there. Uh, The most recent one, a Bluey show for my kids. Are you you aware of Bluey? 
No. Australian dog cartoon. And, I know and, Barney. No. <laughs> Barney's not really a thing anymore. The purple dinosaur. He's yeah. extinct now, right? Yeah, he's kind of extinct. That's true. Uh, but, but Bluey has taken children by storm. Mm. It's actually a pretty good show. I saw um, boxing there once. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a good venue. I think I saw uh, Nick's had one of their special like season ticker events there once. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I saw maybe a comedy show there maybe at some point. Either way, it's a good venue, so go to Ticketmaster.com. Uh, again, it's Thursday night, the 20th. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So if you're a big Giants fan, uh, there'll be a ton of you know all-time Giants there. Make sure you go get your seats at Ticketmaster.com. Guys, they're not expensive. I'm looking right now. The ticket's available. Uh, they're just 25 bucks. They're not expensive. And uh, all the net proceeds will benefit the Giants Foundation, so you'll also uh, benefit a good cause mm-hmm. as well. And again, 201-939-4513. Get your calls and talk some Giants football with us. All right, Paul, so this is one of the shows we like to do every year. Uh, last year, we ended up being a little prophetic, which is not what we were looking for. Tell me about we it. We did knock on wood a lot during the show. I don't want to name anybody today because I'm going to jinx the poor guy. Now, in fairness, up until last year, we <laughs> never really ran into the issue where that guy got hurt. No. But last year was one of those years where everything no, went bad. The one year, maybe when Saquon got hurt, he was the guy we might have brought well. up on this show. But I, I, don't, I don't recall that specifically. But what we're doing is that basically we're going to talk about which player the Giants can least afford to lose on offense and on defense. Another way to put that, who's the most pivotal player? You know, what player could the season pivot on, good or bad? And we talk about, you know, we're talking injuries here, but even just playing really poorly. That could really hurt mm-hmm. the team. So they really need this player to play and to be good for yes. the Giants to, to make a run. Maybe X Factor is is another way to kind of talk about it in, in some ways. So I did want to exclude some players from this conversation because it makes it too easy. Well, they're automatics. Right. Because on offense, you automatically go to the quarterback, obviously. You know, last year, actually, I don't think we chose the quarterback because we didn't think Tyrod was that huge of a downgrade. Um, but this year... I, we're going to take the quarterback out of it because it just adds a whole other layer to the conversation we yeah, don't want to have. Uh, it too complicates complicated. things. Too no, complicated. they don't want to deal with it. I and agree. the other guy in offense we're taking out of the equation is Andrew Thomas. Because, frankly, we saw what happened when they lost Andrew Thomas last year, and mm-hmm. it was not good. And I think that's who both of our choices would have been if yeah, the quarterback's out of the equation. For sure. So we're taking Andrew Thomas out of the equation, and then on defense, uh, I, I decided to unilaterally take Dexter Lawrence out of the equation. Uh, because given Leonard Williams' absence and the lack of a lot of production and experience at the defensive tackle spot after Dexter Lawrence and the fact he's, frankly, probably the best player on the team, that would have been my easy selection on defense, and it would have been yours as well. I mean, look at him. The guy's an all-pro. <laughs> exactly. So those are the guys we took out of the equation for the sake of this conversation, talking about who you might least afford to lose. So, Paul, I'm going to let you go first for both. Okay. I have multiple choices, so if you pick my guy, I can go to my second or third choice, and then we can debate and okay. talk about why those guys are important. Would you like to start on offense or defense first? Well, I'll start on offense. Now, I will tell you, John, I did pick a one and a two. Oh, great. Okay. So, I could give you both of my offense if you want. All right, so here's what we're going to do then. We're going to draft it, okay? So, I'm going to let you pick first. Okay. Do you want to go offense or defense first? Well, I'll go offense. Okay, so I'll let you pick first on offense, and I'll pick first on defense. Okay. Then you pick your second guy in defense, and I'll pick my second guy in offense. Okay. Okay? Okay. So why don't you start on offense first? Who do you got? Well, on offense, for me, it's Devin Singletary. Ooh, he was not even on my list. Okay, I like this. Yeah. Um, The reason I'm going Singletary is pretty simple. When you look at the Giants' depth chart at running back, it is as green as the celery on your supermarket shelf. Uh, They've got... Tracy coming in as a rookie. They've got Eric Gray coming in off of very, very basically spot duty last season. I mean, most of his action was on special teams. Spot duty is kind, to be honest. Uh, right? With you. So, so, and I don't, I mean, is, is Turbo Miller, uh, you know, going to make the team? We, we don't even know if they're going to go with four backs. So I'm looking at the running backs room and I'm saying to myself, okay, if Devin Singletary goes down, Who's next man up? You know, it's funny you mentioned this, Paul. And I don't know. We had a question. It was either cover four or fact or fiction on the website. And the basic thing is, what's the training camp battle you're most excited about? And I wanted to be different. So you know what I picked? I picked backup running back. Okay. And that's very fair. Now, here's the biggest problem, folks. We all know that even a guy like Pacheco 
as a late draft choice, as a rookie, can come in and run for a significant amount of yardage and really help a team's running game. He did it with Kansas City. That can happen. So you could come back at me and say, if you'd like, well, how do you know that Gray or Tracy won't wind up getting a lot of yards on the ground and being the kind of running back that Singletary could be? Maybe they could run for eight or 900 yards. Maybe they could. Possibly. And you could, you could throw that at me. But here's what I would throw back at you and anybody else who wants to challenge the running back call. That is, what are you going to do with pass protection and blitz pickups with guys who really have no experience at the NFL level of doing that? You want to get your quarterback killed. We already know that the offensive line is in flux and trying to improve. And we think they're going to try to get Bellinger out maybe a little bit more in routes. Man, your starting running back better be able to, A, handle checkdowns and outlet routes and hot reads, and he better be able to stick his nose in there and pick up a pass rush. Or your quarterback is in deep doo-doo. No, you know what? I think all those points are fair. So I'm going Devin Singletary. All right. Honestly, I wish I could come up with a good argument to say I disagree with you, but it would just be that maybe running back's not an important enough a position. But that that that's not the only argument because otherwise, you're right. You get past Devin Singletary, it's just a bunch of question marks where you don't know what these guys can can give you. So, Zippo. No. And it's not like they even have a Matt Breda here, who at least you know can be a, a solid guy. You stick in there, and he's going to do what you need him to do. So, no, I think that's fair. All right. Why don't we liquidate offense first? I'll go offense, and you can go your second on offense too. Okay. I don't know if I want to go low-hanging fruit here or not. All right. I had this conversation upstairs with Dan Salomon earlier, and I've become more and more convinced of it. It might seem crazy, but I'm going to explain it. I'm going to go Jermaine Illuminor, and here's why. Okay? Jermaine Illuminor is almost giving you two positions on this roster right now. He's your starting left guard, or he's your starting right tackle, depending on how things go. Right? If Evan Neal proves he can keep the job, great. If not, Jermaine Illuminor is your starting right tackle, right? Okay. If if Neal Potentially. holds up, he's your starting left guard. If Jermaine Illuminor gets hurt, Paul, who's your swing tackle? Right now, your swing tackle looks to be Azudu. Does Azudu have any much to your point in the running backs? Have we seen anything in a game at the NFL level that makes you think he can be that he's proven? That he could be a, a guy that can stick in there, a tackle, and do a good job. That is strictly a projection right now. Correct. Okay. That's the tackle position. And then now, all of a sudden, the amount of pressure on Evan Neal goes up exponentially. Where if Illuminor's not there, Evan Neal better be good. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, we saw what happened last year. Okay? Mm-hmm. Disaster. Okay? Then you go left guard. Illuminor gets hurt. Who's your left guard? Probably Stinney. Probably. Bucks were happy enough to let him go and replace him with Ben Bredesen. Could it be McKeithen? Exactly. So Could it be Azudu? I think you worry about that too. But to me, I feel better about the left guard situation. The whole point of the Illuminor signing in the offseason, and the same reason I was a big fan of Michael Owenu, right? Same, same theory. You want a guy... That can not only start it for you at guard if Neil works out, but you need to have the backstop there. This is the old De- Daniel Jeremiah theory of offensive line play. You can't have any tin cans out there, right? You can't have a guy that other teams can target, and you have to you know, do everything to help. Oh, they'll find him. They'll always find him. Mm-hmm. They'll put the best rusher there, and as an offense, you know they'll double mug guys in the gap so you can't put an extra guy over there to help. There are ways to set up one-on-one matchups with linemen. You can do that no matter what the offensive tries to do in terms of bringing extra guys sure. in and helping. And if Illuminor is not able to go in there and stick in there at right tackle, if, you know, Neil either doesn't work out because of his play, or, frankly, Paul, he hasn't proven he can stay healthy for any long period of time. That's true. He's been hurt his first two years a lot. And you know me, I'm a big fan of Evan. I love Evan. I hope he succeeds. I think he can. But the... Ability for this offensive line to creep back towards the middle, you know, the old PFF expression, creep back towards average, right? Just be an average offensive line. Just don't be terrible, right? Mm-hmm. Play well enough for the offense to function. 
Illuminor is so critical to that because of his multi-positional flexibility that I think if you lose him, you might not get the immediate effect where in week one, oh my gosh, we can't survive. But it eliminates a whole lot of your backstops and, you know, safety nets to prevent a disaster right. at that position, which as we've all seen, can sink your whole season. And that's my argument for Illuminor. Well, Thomas, Illuminor, and Runyon are your three concrete proven offensive starting linemen right now. Neil hasn't proven enough because of the injuries and his play. And JMS is coming off of a rookie season, which we still don't know what he's truly going to be once he develops. And I debated him too, but he didn't play well enough last mm. year for me to put him into the conversation. So you you make a very fair point. And the reason I picked Illumino over Runyon... Well, is because Illumino plays two he positions. the two spots, exactly. And he's proven that he can play two positions at an NFL level. In fact, he's Runyon probably did. actually been better, more proven at right tackle yeah. than he has at the guards. And Run Runyon is just a flopping guard. Illuminor can be a flopping guard and a tackle. Actually, a flopping tackle too. He's four. He can, he's four, he's four position flexibility. Correct. So, so I'm I'm not going to fight you on that one. I think there's there's definitely some some juice there. So I, I left some low hanging fruit for you. So I think I know where you're going to go for your second offense. No, guy. you probably don't. Oh, okay. Daniel Bellinger. Ooh, okay. Daniel Bellinger for the same reason that I picked Singletary. You look at the Giants right now, and that tight end room has a couple of guys who are basically blockers in man hurts and stole all the way on the back end, and that's really what they do, and they've always been limited reserve or rotational kind of players. Theo Johnson, who we are all very high on, is more of a receiver than he is a blocker, although he does have all-around skills. He blocked at Penn State more than he received. He did. He did. <laughs> he did. But I think they're drafting him more to be a receiver. Okay, I think I, that's I honestly fair. think they see him as a two-way guy. I think they also think he can be a two-way guy, but he's going to have to get stronger to do that here I agree than that. he was at Penn State. And, I, and I'm just always very cautious, Paul, to your point. Any rookie tight end, with everything they have to learn, it's a That's tough one. That's asking a lot. For a day three rookie tight end. To tell him to step in right away? Oh, boy. That's asking a lot. These, I know, and I know a lot of the people covering the team with Wall's retirement, you know, and Theo Johnson has flashed in camp. I get it. Guys, I, I got to be honest with you. Like, I think to start the year, I think Lawrence Cager is ahead of him on the depth chart right There's now. There's a very real chance that he will be. I do. I mean, just the other day, Dable even praised Cager. So, to me... Okay, and Cager is not a blocker. I mean, let's not make no, a mistake. No, no, no. I think you have Cager ahead of him as the as the F move tight end. Right. And frankly, Manhorts and Stoll might be ahead of him as a blocker. I right now, I think they have to be. They have to be right now. Like, because, there's a chance week one, Theo Johnson doesn't get a jersey. Like, it's not uh, impossible. It's not impossible. I think it would be disappointing. I'd like to think Maybe. he has a good enough camp that he can get one. Right. That's but we possible. don't know that. No, we don't. Once again. The magic word we've been talking about for weeks here, unproven, okay? Projection. The projection in that tight end room is all over the wall. If you take Bellinger out, and he's the one guy who has proven to be a starting tight end who can do everything. Yeah, he can give you a little bit. He's not going to hurt you anywhere. Bingo. He is out of that lineup. That tight end room now becomes mix and match and try to fill in as many holes as you can with as many snaps as possible from a collection of guys. I agree. It's the same thing with Singletary. I agree. So Singletary and Bellinger would be my two picks. I'm with you. All right, then I'm going to go Malik Neighbors. Uh, I know he hasn't played an NFL snap. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. Uh, you know, we talked about it You know, all year, right? He's the, he's the guy that you hope other defenses have to game plan for. And I don't know if there's another guy besides maybe Jalen Hyatt's, you know, flat out deep speed, which teams have to maybe put a safety over the top on him. Right. Who else are you game planning for in this offense? You're not. No they're, headache they're, players. They're, 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 except no headache for neighbors. Players. And, you know, just him turning into that guy relatively quickly, I think is so essential to this offense becoming what you need it to become. Mm -hmm. And... So I'm I'm going to go with Neighbors as my second guy. And I, frankly, I had Neighbors one on my list, but I thought Illuminor was a more interesting argument, so I decided to list him first. Uh, there's juice to both guys. 
Now, I will say this. I will counter you a little bit on neighbors. Sure. I won't do it on Luminor. Because there's other there's three other wide receivers you're comfortable with. Yes. But I don't think any of them gives you the 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 potential plus that Agreed. neighbors does. Neighbors is a potential headache player. We've discussed this. And maybe even he's there by October. Who knows? He might be there the first week. Who knows? You'd love to see it. But again, always hard to count on rookies. But I would say this. If they had to, if everything was going right and they had to go with Hyatt and Slayton on the outside and, I mean, uh, uh, Slayton, yeah, and Robinson in the slot as your starting threesome, I think they could function as an offense. This isn't about the downside if he's out. It's more about the lack of upside if he's out. And that's that's how I look at and it. And that's very fair. And that's why I say you have some juice with your point. Yep. I'm not going to dispute your point. Oh, I know you're not. I will simply say that, you know, if you wanted to counter a bit, that's where the counter would be. Because when I got your question, the first thing I think about is, Where's the potential downside if the guy's missing? That's how I approach the question. Yeah, the only other guy I had written down here was Runyon. Um, and again, I talk, I kind of debated John Michael Schmitz, but there wasn't really anyone else that I had on my list that I would consider right. there from, from the group. So Very fair. I, I think we hit most of the spots there. All right. What's up? I'm John Wall. And I'm CJ Toledano, and we're starting a new podcast presented by DraftKings called Point Game. We're now joined by three-time NBA Sixth Man of the Year, elite bucket getter let's please welcome jamal crawford to point game king of the court one-on-one tournament if they had it back in your prime do you think you could have took it all i'm gonna be honest with you i don't think i could have took it all but i think i would have shocked a lot of people i think kobe and everybody in their prime kobe would win a one-on-one contest yeah I, yeah because you gotta think Love he's it. gonna guard he don't care about guarding he's gonna guard he's gonna exactly. guard like you see him in the olympics exactly. he's gonna guard and then on I'm top of that like that see that Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sam Cassell to Point Game. I remember you came out from crying tears. <laughs> crying tears. I mean, he was in a culture shock. And then I, his, he's going to withdraw us about winning. Remember what I told you? I said, I said, OG, you think I can get paid and go back and play in college because he didn't need it. <laughs> Check out Point Game with John Wall and CJ Toledano on the iHeartRadio app, DraftKings YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's jump over to defense, but I, I mentioned it before, guys. John's little podcast, Giants.com slash podcast. Uh, slash Giants Huddle, uh, Giants app. Just search for Giants Huddle on your favorite uh, podcast platform. Uh, a lot of good stuff coming your way. Again, Brian Baldinger today, Kim Jones on Thursday. And then we get into our player interview series, guys. Uh, Ten different episodes. We got video on all of them, which I'm very happy about. So they'll be on the YouTube channel, too. Uh, basically, Giants position by positions. I did interviews with all these players uh, last week at Media Day. I got some good stuff from them. So make sure you go check that out on the Giants Huddle podcast. It's all coming your way over the next six weeks leading up to training camp. All right, defense, Paul. Um, I'm going to go first here since you went first on offense. These are easy, by the way. I think the two on defense are really simple. I had two front runners. And, and we're going to agree. And we're I, gonna agree. And I couldn't decide which one to pick first. So one or two, two and one. These are so easy, these two. It's I, not even I close. have three names, but but two guys are ahead of the third one. Okay. So I'm going to go. I'm going to go Deontay Banks here. Absolutely. Uh, just, because, just because we have so many questions about the other corners. And this is, that's going to be a theme with the number, which, which I'm sure the name you're going to pick for your second one. Um, we don't, you know, Cordell Flott outside. We're, we're thinking, you know, Nick McLeod, Andrew Phillips inside, maybe Trey Herndon. We'll see how that goes. But, you know, we worry about the second and third cornerbacks, and we just kind of ignore the fact that Deontay Banks is sitting out there as a second-year first-round pick, who, by the way, was okay as a rookie, but... His he was a rookie. Was okay. <laughs> he was a rookie. But you saw the potential, and I think we all think that potential is going to blossom a bit this year, even mm-hmm. in a new defensive system where there's less man to man. And look, the secondary, I mean, it's a passing league. Pass rush is more important than the secondary, but the secondary is still really, really important. And my gosh, if you don't have Deontay Banks out there and you have a question at all three of your cornerback spots, right. that's a recipe. You know what? Your your pass rush almost gets negated at that point mm-hmm. because you have such issues in the back end. Teams can get rid of the ball quick. You can create mismatches and just attack in different areas. So uh, Deontay Banks is, is one of the easier ones here. That's To me, that was the lock, stock, and barrel number one choice run away. Nice. I, I, I don't think there's any doubt. So what's your two? Well, my two, and if you wanted to break out the corners, you could probably make an argument for the slot corner, although we don't even know who the starting slot corner is going to be today. And that's why we can't name a name. Okay. So it's obviously Bobby O'Karake. Yeah. 
That was know. my number two. I'm and and it has to be um, because Okereke is not only the heart and soul of this defense, and I do believe that he'll get the green dot this year. You know, I don't think anyone's asked Bowen that yet. No that? one has asked yeah, him. I, I'm hoping to get Shane Bowen for all on one before camp. That is one of the first questions that I'm going to want to ask him. I'll be remember, shocked if he does He has wink you safeties that way. Right. And it would, the only other guy it could be is Pinnock. It could be, but I don't see it. I think it's going to be okay. I think it's going to be okay. I agree. And when you consider this guy's 150 tackle machine, put it down, you know, every summer, that that's what he's going to wind up getting. The production is off the charts. The leadership is also off the charts. His football acumen, the way, if you if you get a chance, and I know you've seen this too, John, after some of these OTAs and so forth and so on, we have watched Okereke stay out there on the field with teammates. Mm -hmm. Helping these guys out. Uh, he's a leader. For an additional 20 minutes, talking about how are these linebackers going to work with the safeties? How are the linebackers going to work with the corners? He's out there with some of these other fellas who are newcomers to the team, not necessarily even young players, but some of the other veterans. And he's working over the scheme and the system with them after the coaches go inside on his own, just because he wants to be able to do what he can to improve the unit. I can't say enough about that guy. And not only is it his greatness that I'm pointing to, because I think he is a Pro Bowl caliber player, I'm also pointing to the fact that, okay, there's no Harry Carsons behind him on, this, on the depth chart either. Let's not kid ourselves, John. He, he's the starting middle linebacker on this team. And after that, okay, as much as I may like McFadden, I may like Beavers, the truth is, you know, the drop off after Okereke is just going to be very, very large. Yeah, I mean, who's 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 next? <laughs> I mean, who's next? I mean, I right now it's Beavers and Carter Coughlin, but my gosh, yeah, Carter Coughlin's in that group. Uh, uh, Moorsau, yeah, Moorsau, the rookie. Of he, you know, he he's on the team too. But I, would you really feel comfortable no. if Okereke left the lineup and any one of those guys had to that step would, in? There would be a huge spinning red siren that would Whoa. just be really, really scary. To I be mean, quite honest with you. And so then, that that's easy. See, the two guys are easy. The third, the, my third name was Brian Burns, just because you just paid him all this money. And look, you need pass rush, and especially with questions in the secondary. You take Brian Burns out of this pass rush equation, it gets scary real fast. Isn't that funny you say that, though? Because I thought outside of the nickel corner, which you've already addressed, I thought the third guy who you could make a case for would have been Pinnock. Because the safety spot, right now? You don't feel okay about... We, we, Bel Belton, Belton has been a part-time player. Newbin is, is a rookie. rookie. No, you're right about that. What, what kind of proven teeth do you have from either of these guys' resumes? See, I think we're going at this from two different angles again, which is good. I like this. We are because going at it differently. You're, you're, you're looking at it more the whole if that guy's gone. Correct. The same way I looked at it with Neighbors is how I'm looking at it with Burns, right? I Where, get it. Look, I get it. Ojolari's there. Uh, you know, can you trust him to stay healthy? We don't know the answer to that. And hopefully Burns' presence will limit Ojolari's snap, which will help him stay healthy. But you're removing, I think, I can make the argument even with Dexter Lawrence in the equation, Brian Burns is the most physically gifted defender on this team. You can make that argument. He's definitely got a tremendous amount of tools. So I think you're removing such a big upside from your defense if you take Burns out of it. Could you survive? Would you be okay? Yeah. But I think... You would this, need Ojolari to give you max production to make that happen. This team, Paul, if they're going to do well this year, they need to have one of the better defensive fronts of football. Mm -hmm. With everything else that's going on mm -hmm. on defense, the secondary, that defensive front better be elite. And I don't see how it can be elite if Brian Burns isn't healthy. I think that's fair. Which is why, again, there's juice to a lot of these takes. No, I think this is a good conversation. You this know? is great. And, and depending upon how you want to warp the context of the question and the angle that you want to come at it from, you're going to have different answers. And... Again, I don't think there's a wrong answer to any one that we gave. Yeah, absolutely. 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513. Uh, guys, Giants TV, the Giants digital streaming app. Make sure you go check it out. It's for free. It brings original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to big blue fans. Again, Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Giants mobile app. It is free. Go get it. And, of course, if you want to become a season ticket, what? <laughs> it's free. Go get it. I love it. 
as 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 and this is free and legal, which is even better. Exa- exactly. <laughs> Or, 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 or as uh, my, my new son-in-law likes to say, free 99. What does that How, mean? It's free 99, which means there's no charge. Oh, okay. Free 99. Do you still pay 99 cents, though? No, he says if it's free 99, it's free. free. I kind of like that. Okay. <laughs> Giant fans, you can also take your fandom to the next level with a season ticket membership. Sadly, those are not free. Stay connected to the club all year <laughs> round, not just on game days. Memberships are now available for the 2024 season. There might be a 99 involved, though. To learn more about all the exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. All right. Let's go to the phones. You guys have been waiting patiently. We'll take calls the rest of the way at 201-939-4513. Let's go to Tim in Charleston. He'll lead us off. Tim, what's up, buddy? Hey John Paul, how you doing? Hello Tim. Did See, you like did you like that half hour? That was fun, right? That was fun. And uh, as soon as you announced it, I had my picks in my head, and we're pretty closely aligned. And on offense, I have a Luminor for exactly the same reasons that John stated, so I won't restate them. And then it's funny because for my second guy, I was kind of a toss up between Neighbors and Singletary. But based on the current roster construction, I had to go to Singletary. Not that we couldn't pick up another running back, but based on current roster mm-hmm. construction. On defense, I have the only difference I have is I have a character number one because um, although I agree about the banks being critical, if we don't have a character, we don't have a run defense, and if we don't have a run defense, the other teams aren't going to have to throw on us that much. No, that's a good point, so, Tim. Good point. Um, so, and then um, I just uh, you know to as I mentioned the other day, John, I had some bundles, and I'm going to go through a couple of quick ones here with you today. One is uh, I have a question for you guys. Yeah. How many pad practices with contact are allowed during training camp? Oh, boy. That's a really good question, Tim. Um, while you ask your second question, let me look that up. I want to say it's okay. seven. I think it's more than that. Is it nine? Is it nine? I don't think it's double digits. No, I don't think so either. No, right? yeah. no, it's not double digits. During the period between the mandatory reporting date for veteran players and the final day of preseason training camp, no club may hold more than a total of 16 pad practices. Oh, wow. It just doesn't seem like it. Just doesn't seem like they're that many. Yeah, I mean, remember, no more than. I'm not sure what the, you know. And that includes, but that goes to extends into preseason then, too, right? The training camp is preseason, right? Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah that, that that's correct. That's why. That's why it yeah. seems like less. Yeah. Because once we yeah. get into the preseason, <laughs> it, you know, I, I personally believe the training camp kind of stops at the, at the, uh, at the, first preseason game because now you have games and now you're into preseason it's not training camp anymore where it's just training camp i know technically it is training camp but to me i i shift my mind into a second year because now you have games so my second one was i was thinking about weak links by position slash player right on one on each side of the ball and for me on on um defense it's Mm -hmm. tv two I, I, I feel good about Drew Phillips at slot corner, and we have other backups there. But CB2, whether it's Flott or Herndon or whoever ends up in there, I think I think that's the weak link on the defense. And on offense, clearly, I think it's right tackle because even if, um, you know, if, even if Illuminor ends up sliding out there because Neil gets hurt or can't play or fails, which I hope he doesn't, and don't expect him to, it, it still puts the whole line in flux. So, um and then my, my last one was player surprises on offense and defense. And um, I'm going with two rookies here. And I'll start with uh, on defense this time. I'm going with Tyler Newman. I think he's going to have an awesome rookie year. Um, you know, he, he may, you know, because with his own defense, they're going to be more of his own defense they're going to be playing. I think he'll get some picks. Uh, I like everything I've heard about him from the interviews and his the way he uh, has performed in interviews. And on offense, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, now, this one I'm going to qualify, uh, but, but I'm going with um, um, uh, Theo Johnson. And the reason why is I don't think he's going to have big numbers because we have so many, we got so many good wideouts, assuming they're all healthy. But I think as the year develops and he develops a little bit, of, as the year progresses and he develops a little bit of chemistry with Daniel Jones, I think he's going to have, Quite a number of critical catches. I just feel like I can see—I don't know—it's just a gut feeling. I can see him coming up with some uh, 
some real good catches. And just last thing, John, did you get my little age chart? Yes, I, I did not have a chance to, to look at it yet, Tim, but I but I, I do see it there. All right. Well, guys, thanks for your time. I'll listen to your responses off the air. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate the call. So, surprise player. I have trouble with this question, and I always get as this is one of the usually our you know, 20, 24 questions in 24 days. Mm-hmm. Or like, you know, a uh, player you like, you, you know, you don't expect to do well and they do well. We think about this thing every day. Like, I have trouble thinking of things that could be surprises because we, I feel like we break down every aspect of the team every day. It's, right. It's, it's tough for us to find the surprise. And also, we're here so much. We see these guys. There's not a lot that will surprise us because we know what we're seeing on the practice field. Right. So it's a lot harder for us to make that proclamation that it would be you guys out there on the other side of the camera. Now, we have had surprises before. I'm trying to think. There was a player last year that I know took both of us by I'll, surprise I'll, I'll give you one guy who was surprised. Nick McLeod's uh, play as a corner has huh. probably surprised a lot That's of people. Too, like two years ago, Fabian Moreau's play as a corner was that, a surprise. Absolutely. That was a good one. You know, so those do happen. They do happen. But, you know, I think those surprises come more because the guy's a late addition you know, and Pinnock, he wasn't here at camp. Pinnock may be a bit of a surprise as a late uh, addition. I was going to say McFadden. Maybe. Oh, yeah, Mike McFadden's a good one. I don't think any people, we didn't expect him to be as good as he was last year. I think that's a good one. Yeah, I, I suppose that would be all right. Uh, I will say this, though, if I could go off topic a little to what he said. Yeah, when we mentioned Tyler Newbin a minute ago, I'll give you one. How how much of a bold prediction is this? That of this year's Giants rookie class, Tyler Newbin plays the most snaps of any of them. You'd be okay with that, wouldn't you? Will he play more snaps than neighbors? If he wins the starting job, he will. I, mean, I don't think Neighbors is going to be off the field much either. I got to be honest with you, but yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. How about this? I believe Tyrone Tracy will have a bigger impact on the offense this year than, or on the team this year than Theo Johnson. Oh, I don't think that's much of a stretch. In fact, see, this Tra- is why I stink with the surprise thing. <laughs> yeah, because Tracy Tracy could also wind up doing it on kickoff return too. All right. Well, what if I said on offense? Strictly on offense yeah, from from offense? scrimmage. Yes. Because I was going to say that, and then I backed off, you and know, I said, "No, you know why? You know why? Because from scrimmage, he might wind up being the third down back." I know. This I stink with the surprises. Thing. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. <laughs> you really kind of you kind of muddied it, that one on us because we don't have anything clear. I'll that Pearson, o- Ojolari, just because I think less snaps could keep him healthy throughout the year. Yeah, and that was specifics. That'd be a good plays. one. He could come in. I think he could excel. And I think that's how I answered one of our cover threes or factor fictions when they asked me that too. I think or under the no, it was the, the way they phrased it was under the radar player, and I picked Ojolari because I think I think teams with the fans have kind of written him off a little bit, mm-hmm. and I, I don't think they should. Well, see, that's why Newbin's a bold prediction because most people will just go right to neighbors. Newbin would be a bold for prediction yeah. for snaps. I agree, but I think he could do it. I don't. I don't think that's a, a huge stretch. No, I mean, I think Newbin was one of those very, you know, safe picks because he's so smart and he's been very you know, so highly much thought football, of. So at a at a big time program yeah. too. All right, let's go to uh, Len in Columbia, Maryland. I haven't talked to Len in what I feel like is a month. Len, what's going on? Hey guys, how you doing? What's Hello. up? You know, um, the answer to the question of the day is really pretty depressing. I mean, <laughs> okay, pick why? A posi- pick a position. Uh, you can at least afford to lose anybody <laughs> off the off the group that start. Uh, I mean, the depth the depth is just a problem. Of course, it's a problem around the league too. But we better keep our top thirty players healthy. Well, and well, you like go, you said, that is a key for every team around the league, mm-hmm. man. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. In- injuries but, but end I seasons think, fast. I, I think the drop-offs for us are just really, really – and that's what you're talking about, you know, when you pick a position. Let, let, let's, let's go to tight end for a second. I'm, intri- I'm, I'm going to give you an over-under. I don't want to spend too much time on it. No, go ahead. Number of catches by tight ends this season, 35. I go over for that. Altogether, I'm going to go over 35. Mm-hmm. I think I think Bellinger will get the 30-ish or so on his own. Yeah. I, I'd probably okay. go 45. Would be a, a oh, wow. much, much wow. more. That'd be a much more realistic number. Total catches by the tight end room, I'll go 45. Right. right. What do we do if, if a determination is made by the coaching staff that Neil just can't cut it at tackle? 
what what do we do this year? No. I think that decision is going to be made pretty quickly. I mean, I think Illuminor goes out the right tackle, and okay. I think they. And I, my guess, honestly, right. I, th- I think they would try Neil at guard. You know, Len, it comes which, down which to is, good. But Paul, let me let me yeah, say yeah, go ahead. to John. Go ahead. Is, to John's point. Um, that that's not a bad switch, if I remember correctly. <laughs> and you you guys would know the answer to this probably more so than I did. The one year that Neil played guard at Alabama, he played left guard. Uh, I believe that is mm-hmm. correct. I can check that though, and that but that mm-hmm. was you know that was yeah. like six years ago now. That yeah. was that, that was a yeah, long yeah, time yeah. ago. But, uh, so maybe maybe Illumina from left guard to right tackle, and Neil from right tackle to left guard is is kind of the easiest way to go if you really think if you really think Neil, you know, can play left guard. And that's why I had Luminor so high on my list. Len, when, yeah, when, yeah, I know. I, I, I can understand. Yeah, 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 for sure. I can understand. Um, I think that's the reason also why Brasillo is playing Azudu out there all spring. He's he's getting him tackle work all spring because he'd like yeah. to know, is that a viable option? Oh, yeah. I'm not saying wow. that he wants that to be, but I, I think he's trying to figure it out. I know. I know. I, I'm just not the biggest Azudu fan, so that's why I'm, I'm moaning here on my end of the phone. <laughs> Um, All right, so Len, I can tell you right now, Evan miss, Neal, we, Len, Len, real quick, Evan Neal in 2019 played 747 snaps at left guard, um, okay. and then right. he played 790 snaps at right tackle the following year, and then 1,100 okay. snaps at left tackle the year after. Okay. That. That's a ways ago. Okay. Yeah. yeah, 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 it's a ways ago. Yeah, yeah, for sure, but uh, he, has play, he has played left guard. I'm, I'm just looking for the easiest move to make, sure. because I, I guess my real question is, what if he doesn't? If he's not the starting right tackle, I mean, what do you what do you do with Neil this year? I think you try him at guard. He, I mean, does he even get a uniform? I mean, if he's not the starter, I, I you know, I mean, I I don't know. Um, there's one problem. Missed, there's one problem with that, uh, Land. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think yeah. it's important to make this note here. Yeah, yeah, go for it. As much as Brasillo has to, Brasillo has told us that he wants to work these guys and give them flexibility. Neil hasn't done that left guard stuff in years, as we've already discussed. He yeah. hasn't been able to do much at all during the spring. Now, yeah. when he gets to training camp, I'm yeah. sure Brasillo's going to want to say, look, you're our lead candidate for right tackle. Yeah. They're not going to waste time practicing him at left guard. Oh, I know. I so know now, yeah. now, if John, if he doesn't, work out at right tackle right away. They're not just going to throw him in at left guard and put oh, him into the I... deep end of the pool well, with no work. Well, no. Well, two well, Lens. Well, 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 no, Len, I think this is why your initial point was correct and important. I don't think this is a decision that can wait till like, August 25th. Well, Co- Brasillo says he wants it by late in training camp. Well, he wants to know who his starting five going to be. I think if, if, if be. your plan is, your, your secondary plan is to move Neal inside, I want that decision made by... The second preseason game. Well, because he's got to get some work there. Bingo. So I, I he's, want, he's had none there since his days at Bama. So I want him by, you know, maybe you give him two preseason games. All right. If you get through that well, second preseason game and okay. you decide that I can't trust him at right tackle or whatever, yeah, I think then you immediately you get yeah. after that Texans game, right. you get back, you put him in practice the next week at guard. Third preseason game, he plays guard in the preseason The game. tricky part okay. is, once they get back on the 24th of July for their first practice, that's not giving him a lot of time to prove to Priscilla whether or not he is the starting right tackle. Three and a half weeks. It, that's, you know, Priscilla may maybe, think he needs more. He may, he maybe, may not have an answer. You maybe, don't know. Maybe my- What's up? I'm John Wall. And I'm CJ Toledano, and we're starting a new podcast presented by DraftKings called Point Game. We're now joined by three-time NBA Sixth Man of the Year, elite bucket getter. Let's please welcome Jamal Crawford to Point Game, King of the Court one-on-one tournament. If they had it back in your prime, do you think you could have took it all? I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think I could have took it all, but I think I would have shocked a lot of people. I think Kobe and everybody in their prime, Kobe would win a one-on-one contest. Yeah, I, yeah, because you got to think, Love he's going to guard. He don't care about guarding. He's going to guard. He's going to exactly. guard. Like, you see him in the Olympics, exactly. he's going to guard. And then on I'm top of that. Like that, see that. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sam Cassell to Point Game. I remember you came out from crying tears. <laughs> crying tears. I mean, he was in a culture shock. I, he's going to withdraw us about winning. Remember what I told you? 
I said, I said, OG, you think I can get paid and go back and play in college because it ain't me? <laughs> Check out Point Game with John Wall and CJ Toledano on the iHeartRadio app, DraftKings YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Maybe my answer to how long is the leash for Evan Neal at right tackle the same as yours, but I'm going to say it in a little different words. If he doesn't start at right tackle at the second preseason game, He's he's sitting on the bench the whole year. He's not moving. He's not, we don't have time to move him to guard. I mean, if he if he fails this test, it, it's going to happen quickly. Well, Led, he's going to get one. I think he gets one preseason game. Led, I think it's important to watch not only those preseason games and how they will utilize him there, yeah, but yeah. how he is going to practice every single day during training camp. And that's yeah. going to be a big deal and a yeah. hint as to what they want to do. And Len, I wasn't sure if it was Paul and I or Matt and I. We talked about this last week. You remember, you might not even get Neil in the first preseason game. If you may he's not. doing the competitive oh prep. No, remember, be, no, only because you're getting those live snaps that week in With practice Detroit. against the Lions. Oh. So you'll get, and Len, and that, that's fine. If he gets a yeah, bunch yeah. of live snaps against Aiden Hutchinson during the week, mm-hmm. that's cool. Yeah. You know, that that's good enough Yeah, for me. Yeah. 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 Now, now understand where I'm coming from. I want this to work out. All right. I mean, I'm not. Oh, we get I'm it. That, I want, I'm like every, I'm like most other folks. Because I, you're I not Charlie, Len. Right That's I, why. I you're not Charlie. That's why you want it to work out. <laughs> oh, my good friend Charlie. Hey, listen. That was. By the way, I want to get to 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 uh, Charlie's answer to your roster evaluation on Friday in just a minute. I thought that actually, if I may, I thought that was actually a pretty good call from Charlie. Um, if if John Michael can't cut it on this team, that's a terrible setback. Yeah, that would hurt a lot for sure. He's a number two pick. Yeah. Oh my that god, that would be that's dreadful. A, that's an awful. That that's it. I mean, if we look out, you know, if by his fourth year he's a backup. Uh, I mean, if it just doesn't work, that that that's just just an awful loss. You're looking but too far I, ahead. I, I have confidence. I, I know <laughs> I've said this before. And I think Paulie agreed with me the last time I said it. I, I think there's one reason why we got that assistant line coach. His job is it's a one-liner. For range. Make Sean Michael Smith a major league player. All right, uh, final point, Len. I want to make sure we get to two more calls here. Okay, thank you. Well, well yeah, let me, let me – can I say one more yeah, thing, John? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, make Listen, your final point. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic, as we all are every off season. Um, but, you, you know, John, who cares if, if, if Pro Football Focus ranks us 31 or we think they're 27? No, it doesn't matter. I, I mean, we're, we're a bottom 25% team. I mean, that's, well, Len, you know. Well, Len, they picked six in the draft last year. Yeah. That, that, they could be picking six again. Well, that, 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 until you prove otherwise, yeah. that's yeah. how teams are going to view you. That's exactly how everyone yeah. viewed the Giants before they made the playoffs and won a playoff game two years ago, too. Len, yeah. people outside the building Thank are not going to grade Appreciate this team on projections. They're not going to do that. They're, they're going to they're gonna just say projections to the wayside. They want to know production, and that's why they're grading the Giants so low. They're not going to take projections into account. The people in the building are looking at projections and saying, look, we think we can get this out of these guys, and that's why they have more optimism. And, guys, look, this is last year. That's a six-win team. We know about all the injuries and the why behind it, right? But if you want to dissect it even more, that's six wins in a year when you led the NFL in turnover ratio. I know. I and know. those six wins came against all the teams drafting ahead of you, mm-hmm. except for the one win against the, the Packers. Well, the offensive efficiency was horrible. So Horrible. Last year was an ugly year. I get why people are pessimistic about it. I get it. Yep. I get it. 201-9-3, but that's why we're going to play the games here in 2024. Let's go to Abdul in Minnesota. He's up next. Abdul, what's up? Hey, guys. Um... So is the question of the day? I, I missed the question of the day. So yeah, it was. I, it was uh, who is the player you could least afford to lose on offense and defense without Thomas uh, Lawrence and Daniel Jones being factored oh, in? Yes. Okay, <laughs> all right. So like, that's obvious. But if you take those guys out of there, um, let's see. Let's the running back, Singletary. Yep, that uh, that was Paul's choice. Yep, because I think he uh, he's the only legitimate, at least proven. Uh, Professional, you know, uh, uh, running back we have right now in the stable, and on defense, I would say uh, Banks. Yep, that was that, that that was my first <laughs> choice, and our second choices on the on the both sides was Okereke on defense, just because you know who knows what's behind him there, and then 
I had Jermaine Illuminor just because of because of the conversation we just had with Len. Yeah. Uh, he provides that backstop at right tackle in case Evan Neal has injury issues or he doesn't play well enough. And I just think, you know, the last thing this team could afford this year is having another, you know, turnstile issue on the offensive line in any spot like mm-hmm. you had in many spots last year with all the injuries. So And I took Which Bellinger kind of because of the tight end room being, being slight as well. Yeah. Kind of goes into why I called. So um, are, the, are the Giants a meritocracy or are they handing out, like, scholarships? Because I, I know it's, it, with, with the way practice is, is structured now without the contacts and stuff, um, it's hard to – but okay, my, my point is I don't see any real competition uh, in, in positions. They're, they're saying Evan Neal is the starting right tackle – you know, oh, no, 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 Abdul. They said he's going to start out at right tackle, but I believe Joe Shane even said he's going to have to play well mm-hmm. enough to keep that spot. And, right, I think, right. and I think the reason Jermaine Illuminor is here is in part because if he can start at guard, but they were going to be sure when they spent money this offseason, they were going to bring in somebody that they were comfortable starting at right tackle. So if, if you don't want to call it a competition, that's fine. But Evan Neal is going to have to play well enough to hold on to that job. Are they going to give El- Illuminor uh, reps at right tackle? No, because I, I, because I think they know what they have in him at mm-hmm. right tackle. So they don't need to see that because they know what they have. So they have a ben- – okay. again, this is just my guess. They have a right. benchmark in their minds of a level of play that they will need to see from Evan Neal over the course of the preseason. If he meets right. that threshold, he'll stay there. If he doesn't meet and that also, threshold, here comes Jermaine Illuminor. That's how I think they're going to look at it. You know, the and, the Perts, the, uh, the the Lemieux of the world, the guys who, you know, were around for a while and either didn't give you great production or couldn't get on the field because of various injuries, those guys are gone. Well, and, and you know, Abdul, you know, I, I they're th- gone. And I think a big good judge of this will be, is Marcus McKeith on the roster this year? Right. Is he around just because he was a draft pick or... Does he own a spot? Or, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? So I think we haven't really been able to figure that out yet with this new crew because Joe Shane's draft picks have only been here for two years, mm-hmm. and you're rarely going to cut guys after two years when you're a draft pick. But I think we're going to start finding that out this offseason. I, I just, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable, and it could be just the, the reporting by the beat writers, how, how they're, uh, how they're, you know, the perception of what's going on. Um, the fact that they already said Daniel Jones is the starter. Not that I think Locke is better, but I would like an open competition. And, I, you know, and, you know, and I said, I'm not sure if Shane actually, well, Shane actually did say uh, Jones is a starter, but I don't like that, how they say that. They should be like, you know, let's see who the best man is. Well, yeah. Brian, Brian Dable would say, Abdul, to play devil's advocate, there's an open competition at every position right. when you head into a season because everybody's competing for a position every day. And I think that's how the coaching staff looks at it. And to be frank with you, it's not like Drew Locke's NFL resume is loaded with playoff spots either. I mean, to be right. fair, I, you know, da- said, Daniel Jones I did something Jones really well to help this coach be coach of the year two years ago. I mean, right. you, to, to, to even suggest that he shouldn't hitch his wagon to him right now wouldn't make any sense at all. But look, I'll, I'll say this, Abdul. I give you, and again, I don't think this is going to happen. I'm just throwing out a, a hypothetical, theoretical thing here. If you get through the preseason, and again, I don't think this is I'm 99.9% sure this will not happen. And, you know, Daniel Jones is an absolute disaster for a month and a half from July 23rd to the start of the year. And Drew Locke is lights out phenomenal. Maybe we have that conversation. I'm not going to rule that out. Uh, I just, based on what I've seen in the spring, I, I would find that hard to believe. Mm-hmm. Right. And as I said, I think Jones is a much better quarterback, but I just... Because you know, you know, you said that they picked six last year. No one should have a you know a a, a locked in starting position. You know what I mean? It's like Abdul, I hear you. Good. The good thing about it though is that yes. Daniel Jones has plenty to play for this year, even if it's not yes. like an open competition with his with his contract situation and how people talk about him. There's no lack of motivation there. You know what I'm saying? And as as Len just said, I hope it all works out. I, I'm not wishing Jones to regress or be able to regress or whatever and have no, you know, I hope everything works out wonderfully. That's, you know, I want to be a happy Giants fan, but I <laughs> just, I'm a little, I get uh, as Paul to have Ajita <laughs> when I come to think about certain things. Okay? I got gotcha. you. I understand. Abdul, I have, I have Ajita too, man. Look, I, I get it. This is a very important year. It's the third 
year of this regime, last year did not go well. The first year went extraordinarily well. This is a big pivot point year here in terms of how this yeah. thing's going to play out. Look, man, l- last year was like swallowing a jar of spoiled sauce, and that's never yeah. good. Okay, exactly. but that's just the way it well, happened. Well, I, ho- I hope this month goes quickly, and uh, you know, it's, it's training camp comes quickly. I, just, I really just can't wait. I'm very excited. Yeah, right, and unfortunately, thank you, I do appreciate. It. We're gonna get the training camp. They're gonna be in, you know. T-shirts and shorts for another four or five practices. And I'm like, I, know. Oh, I can't wait for the pads to come on. So mm-hmm. I'm not even really excited for the first training camp practice. I'm excited for the first padded training camp practice because that's when we're going to get O-line, D-line, one-on-ones, which is what I, you know, that I've lived for that stuff. That's fantastic. You might not even get wide receiver DB one-on-ones until the pads come on. I'm salivating for the f- first three practices against the Lions. I will take the... That's going to be really, really good stuff for me. I agree, but I will my palate will be satisfied by regular padded practices first. Because at least you can see line play. I I understand that. And just watch it, frankly, watching Brian Burns go against Andrew Thomas one-on-one. That'll be fun. That's just going to be fun. Yeah, of course. Watching neighbors and Deontay Banks try to cover each other with pads on. It's going to be fun. I I thought last year when we were in Detroit and we watched the Giants and Lions practice, I, I thought that was... It was hard because the way they had it set up on the three different fields, we had to really negotiate... You know, what we were trying to watch uh, and the way they ran them, it was difficult to have eyes in the back of your head. But I thought we we did get some really fruitful uh, stuff out of that. The first team offense and team drills that first day, as we talked about, was, was a bit of a disaster. It was really rough. but And then it got they, much better. Right. And you, you didn't get a sense that they were getting dominated in the one-on-one drills. No, Whether not at all. Whether it was the DBs or the O-line, D-line stuff, they held their own in those drills. So I'm with you. Yeah. They, they did really well, actually, in those drills, it, especially against Hutchinson. It, it was not like the Bengals in, what was that, 2015? Oh, that where was... We, where we walked out of there and, like, Tyler Eifert basically had a mortgage on Giant Stadium and Geno yeah. Atkins had the other half of the mortgage on Giant Stadium and it was just Ooh. a disaster. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I hope that this summer's workout with Detroit overall grades out better because you'd like to think the Giants have improved. We'll have to wait and find out. Jason in New Haven will wrap us up today. Hey, Jason. Hey, what's up, fellas? What's Hi. up, man? Good, good, good. I haven't heard the show in a while. I've um, just been busy, but uh, thanks for taking my quick call. I'll make it quick because I know it's the end of the show. Yes, sir. Um, the first the first thing I want, and I'm usually like to start off positive, um, but the first thing I thought about um, – and maybe you guys can agree or disagree with me. And I hate to bring up the past, and I'm not going to bring up – I'll let people just, you know, disseminate who was the GM and front office at the time. But the more I was thinking about it the other day, that 20 – that Kadarius Tony draft, oof. Oh, Paul um, – no, 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 Jason, Paul and I talked about this on Friday show. Right now – Oh, okay. If I there's, didn't hear no, it. that's okay. No, you're fine. Uh, if there's one draft and, you know, Len brought up some of the depth on the roster, do you know why the know why the depth on the roster isn't very good right now? It's because the 2021 draft, other than Aziz Ojolari, is a zero right now. It's an absolute zero, and that's a problem. That's a giant bruise on, on the uh, Giants you roster. You know, even Tony, Huge. even Tony, who got traded for a draft pick, well, that draft pick then got traded for Darren Waller, who just retired. Mm-hmm. So you got zero out of that one, too. That's a yeah, really, that, really painful draft. Yeah, that draft was, oof. That and was the problem one. is, even though... And they could have just sat there and picked Rashawn Slater if they would have just listened to me. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and, and, and the problem is, the residue from that bruise impacts this administration. Because it was yeah. it was right before they got here. It was the most recent draft before the change. So these right. guys, while not responsible for it, have to deal with the after effects of it. Yeah, yeah. But you know, be that as it may, we're on to twenty twenty four and new excitement. So two things that I wanted to bring up and I'll take everything off the air unless you want to interject. No, go ahead, please. Um, um I know not you guys, um, but you know, I know I've always called and said I'm 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 still a believer in Daniel Jones. Um, last year, of course, you know, like we've talked about at nauseum, it just it just everything that could have hit us last year hit us. It, it just it was just I kind of almost have to chalk last year's up and just be like, you know, we just got to erase that from the memory and keep it moving because the injuries, the, the just everything just wasn't working. But I want to remind fans when I think of Daniel Jones in a good light. Now, has he been perfect? I think all three of us could say no. He hasn't been. He's mm-hmm. had his flaws, and he probably still does. But I want to bring everybody back. And I know you two may agree with me. I want to bring everybody back to two games of the 2022 season that 
the Minnesota game, and I know people are going to be like, oh, that was Minnesota. You know, they didn't know what they were doing on defense. I don't want to hear it because they were they were a playoff team that year, if I'm not mistaken. They won tw- did they won 12 games or 13 mm-hmm. games, whatever, whatever they won. Even they more so, the team. Giants were behind in that game, in the playoff game. They, were, right. they had to come back from behind. Minnesota had everything going their way at the beginning of that playoff game, and you're on the right. road, and Daniel Jones held that thing together. Absolutely. So I want to bring two. I want to bring two things. I'll make it quick. The play. I'll, I'll go back to the 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 big, middle of the season when we played in London against Green Bay. Everybody fails to realize when people talk about well, Daniel the guy is he this is he that. I want people to really understand who he was throwing the ball to in eleven personnel in that game. It was Richie James who actually played very well for us that year off the scrap heap. We had David Sills and we had Marcus Johnson. Mm-hmm. And I remember the play drive before, after Saquon got hurt, because he got hurt in that game. He was yep. out for the series. Yep. And he drove us down the field on Green Bay when they was on fire at that time without Saquon, our best quote-unquote player at the time. And he was great, but people say he was the best player. I disagree with that, but that's fine. And drove them down the field and scored, and we won that game. Second play I want people to realize, and I know it's more than just plays. Has been He hasn't had a consistent body of work, but I still believe him because the Minnesota game, I want everybody to realize and remember that pass he threw to Hodgins against, on the sideline mm-hmm. was an incredible throw. And most NFL quarters aren't, quarterbacks aren't making that throw. So when people are dogging on Daniel, and I get it. Has he brought some of this on his own? Of course. No quarterback's perfect. I'm not asking Daniel Jones to be Mahomes. I'm not asking him to be Eli. But can he be a functional quarterback that can take it to the playoffs? I believe 100% absolutely. So those two plays stick out to me. The 81, I think it was like a 90-yard drive against Green Bay, and then that pass he had against Hodgins against the sideline. Second, I'm bullish on our team this year. I think we have a lot of pieces. Now, like I always say, it has to be played on the field. But I was reading something with PFF or some – not that I not that I think they're the God or the Bible, but they had it as the thirty first ranked roster, yep. which I thought was just absolutely ridiculous. Like we had that conversation on Friday come. too, Jason. It's funny. Oh, all all right, this all stuff right. no, you're good. If you want to listen, just go back to Friday's show. All the stuff you call up about, we talked about it. <laughs> yeah, you're all over yeah. it. So I'll make it quick. So I, I disagree with that. I think that's just pure BS. I mean, Brian Burns, Andrew Thomas, Dexter Lawrence, O'Kara Kay. Fibs. I'm even bullish on our, on our young guys. I like neighbors. I think he's going to be incredible. I mean, I'm not at practice. You guys see him more than, of, of course, than the fans. But from what I'm hearing in the tea leaves, he, he's, he's pretty. Now, I get it. He's OTA. There's no tackling. There's no press, man. But you can see, I'm, you guys have doing this, been doing this for a while. You guys know talent when you see it. And apparently, he has everything you're looking for in a receiver. And then the last point, uh, maybe you guys could tell me, there's two players I've been kind of interested in hearing how they've been doing in OTAs, and I'll take it off the air. Uh, on defense, I'm looking at Chapman, uh, the undrafted free agent we picked up. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, And I know with linemen, I get it, fellas. It's hard to really judge because they're not hitting, they're not tackling. That's the problem. They're not getting a block. Yeah, I know, I know. But you can see, you know, their movement skills. You can see the quicks. Who on offense? The, and then on offense, I want you guys to tell me how – Either because I think I'm a big Bellinger fan. I think he was underutilized, and I get that we we traded for Waller last year. And you know, congrats to him in his retirement. You know, hope he does well. But I thought Bellinger was, in my opinion, was the man casted out. I know people say, well, he had a down year, but they didn't really use him, in my opinion. They kept him on the line to help with Evan Neal, which we needed. But I think he had soft hands. Now, is he a Darren Waller type or George Kittle like? He could run twenty yard in routes and all that, probably not. But I think he, he's one of those players that keeps your offense on schedule, and we still need those guys. Yes, we have neighbors. Yes, we have Hyatt. But you're not always going to throw 20-yard, 30-yard touchdowns every series. You need guys that can keep you on schedule, and that's also yep. running backs. We got it, Jason. So, so let me know how Chapman looks and uh, the tight ends, and thanks, fellas. Thank you. And again, two positions where physicality is a big deal. Mm-hmm. I will say this about Chapman. That guy is the weirdest body type I've ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he's, he's also got the ability to, to pinch it as a fullback. Uh, he showed that in college. He's tiny. He's just so short. I, I, 
I think he's practice squad material myself. I agree with you. I'm with you on that. Now, as far as Bellinger, I will say this. I thought he did have a down year last year. He, is, uh, he had some critical penalties, which you did not want to see from him. I don't think his inline blocking his was. His blocking either. was, it took a step back from his, his rookie season. Yeah. His blocking his blocking came down a notch. And I quite frankly think that he, he would tell you if he was sitting here that he was disappointed in his second season. He's got to reverse that and become the guy that they thought he could be after his rookie year. Paul, good stuff. Yeah, John. For Paul Dottino, I'm John Schmelk. That's Big Blue Kickoff Live presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Giants. Thank you to Pearson. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Because you want to hear bacon and eggs on your outdoor griddle, not the scraping of rust. Introducing the Weber Slate Rust-Resistant Griddle. Stays ready, not rusty. With a carbon steel cooktop, pre-seasoned and ready to cook on right out of the box. The Weber Slate heats evenly edge to edge up to 500 degrees. All you'll hear is the gasp of amazement from friends and family when you serve the food. Cooking with the Weber Slate rust-resistant griddle just sounds delicious and tastes even better. You know that vibe? When you're rolling in your all-new Camry and you and wifey aren't seeing eye to eye? Woo! That's icy. Well, here's what you do. Use the available 12.3-inch multimedia touchscreen to pull up you all's favorite crooner. The minute she hears that high note floating from the available JBL premium audio, oh baby, you'll know you just went from icy to thawed out. The vibe just shifted for the better with the all-new Camry. Toyota, let's go places.